Hello everybody. Um, today I have decided to, uh, instead of doing like a regular tutorial, I'm going to go ahead and um, talk about some interesting things in history that I um, am learning and, you know, have learned over this past semester and just think are really interesting things to know. <laughs> so um, I'm going to go ahead and talk today a little bit about um, Greek mythos as well as Greek history, like classical Greek, ancient Greek. Um, they're kind of muddy for me, honestly, um, just because there's so much history packed into like such a short time and like the classes that I take always end up combining it with Rome, even though um, I don't think they should. Like the Greeks are a society that probably could easily stand on their own, especially, the, I mean, they have like several <laughs> thousand years worth of history that you could look at. So it's really hard to get deep into anything. But um, I'm pretty familiar with the classical Greek history and then obviously some of the mythology. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that today. Um, I'm going to be highlighting one specific historical or I guess mythical figure, uh, which is our dear Persephone. Um, She's a figure in history that I think is really interesting. Obviously, um, she was a she was a Greek goddess, so she wasn't real. But like the mythos surrounding her um, actually ties into Greek history in a really interesting way, and I want to talk about that today, and then some other things as well. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and light this. You're not gonna be able to see it on camera, but I'm going to enjoy it. It smells nice. It smells nice. So, and then I'm gonna just go ahead and kind of do. Eh do my makeup while we are talking about this interesting figure. So let me go ahead and get that going. Oh Lord. And oh yeah, there we go. Okay, cool. So got like a really long freaking wick which I think is cool but yeah there we go okay so before we get started on all that I did want to just tell a funny story so if you did watch my last video then you will know that my cat um, that my cats I guess I should say were making filming difficult and they'll probably make filming today difficult as well but you know it's just something that you have to deal with if you're a cat owner um, I ended up forgetting to, I just got this, I just got this, um, Anastasia hydrating facial oil and, um, I forgot to, to put the cap back on and I came back a few hours later and my cat had apparently knocked it over and spilled it all over all the stuff that I had left on here. So like all of my brushes and stuff were covered in oil. Uh, if you don't know, Anastasia is a very pricey brand. Um, it was about $40 for this. Um, so I'm not very happy with them, but you know, I still love them, but yeah, so just, just, just think about that when I use it today. Um, I'd only used it twice. It's already almost gone. So anyways, uh, if you don't know the story of Persephone, I guess I didn't get a compact. Okay. Um, give me just a second. Anyways, if you don't know the story of Persephone, um, she was the Greek goddess of spring. Um, she, I guess Hades was like really into her. So he actually went and kidnapped her from her mother Demeter. Um, and then like dragged her to the underworld in his chariot. So, not great. And then basically because she ate um, a few pomegranate seeds while she was down there, she was like tied to Hades, like forever. So her mom was pissed and um, decided to go ahead and uh, not let anything grow. Because Demeter, um, Demeter was like kind of the goddess of like the harvest and like those kind of things. 
So like really important for farming. Um, she decided to just not let anything grow until Hades returned Persephone to her. Um, they basically ended up working out a custody agreement where uh, she would stay with mom half the year and then with uh, her uncle slash husband the rest of the year. So um, that's just really kind of a weird story. Um, interesting. Uh, I will say that I think that especially like the marital arrangement is interesting to me because like women back then, first off, they weren't given a lot of choice in marriages. Um, if you don't know, which probably a lot of you don't, um, Hades and Demeter as well as like Zeus and all of the other like main gods, um, the oldest gods were the children of Cronus and Rhea who were titans and um, you know after Zeus broke out of Cronus's whatever or he came back and I think he killed Cronus um, and then like all of his siblings popped out of Cronus's guts because apparently Cronus doesn't digest anything or doesn't digest gods but um, that's a story for another time so yeah so he is uh, Persephone is Demeter's daughter and then Hades would have been her uncle because um, he is Demeter's brother uh, son of Cronus and Rhea so that's a whole thing um, I thought this was interesting primarily because like if a woman so women in classical Greece didn't have especially in Athens didn't have a lot of control over their marriages um, well, it was kind of cringe. Uh, sometimes, like, if they married someone and their husband died, then they would be required to marry their closest male living relative, um, which oftentimes would be their uncle. So I thought that was kind of an interesting parallel into, like, actual Greek society. So I thought that was interesting. I decided to go ahead and use my Venus palette as my mirror for today since we're talking about, um, Greek gods and also culture. I'm going to talk a lot about Athens today. It's the one that I know most about. It's the one that like honestly we as a society know most about um, because it was like the dominant culture. Obviously a lot of people know a little bit about Sparta now because of like the popularization of like 300 and stuff like that but um, Athens is actually really interesting so that's the whole thing. Um, there's some really interesting characters from Athens. I will say it was not a nice place for women to live. Um, basically if you were a citizen, which would have basically meant that you were upper class, then you were not... Mm, then you were not supposed to really go outside. So like uh, your husband would be going to like movies, well not movies, you know there's not movies back then, but like plays and like um, going out and you know hanging out with his you know highfalutin buddies, you know members of the senate or whatever and the wife was not supposed to be there. She's actually not allowed outside of the house without a male escort. Uh, and it had to be a family member. So, <laughs> couldn't just be any random guy. Had to be a family member. Um, women were basically supposed to weave and make babies until they died. Um, obviously, again, this is like the top tier of society. So things were probably pretty different for, you know, people who weren't considered citizens. But I think it's interesting to talk about. Um, men, while they were out cavorting and drinking would uh, hang out with courtesans or prostitutes uh, while they were out in public. So those were the only kind of women that you would see in the public sphere, um, you know, with powerful men. Uh, if a woman was seen outside with her husband, it was like a big scandal. So like we see this 
with with Nira uh, in her trial they basically questioned the legitimacy of the marriage because Nira uh, wasn't considered a citizen I think she had been lower class and then like her husband married her and it was like a whole big scandal because he took her everywhere with her he loved her and he wanted to be with her and so they were talking about how she was basically um, acting like a whore just by being out in public with her husband. It was just kind of sad. It was just really kind of sad. So like, it wasn't expected to have like a love match in marriage. They often equated it to like sowing seeds, like just, you know, making the next generation. So they didn't necessarily expect to have like sex outside of like procreation with these people. Like your courtesans were the ones that you had sex with for fun. It's just kind of crazy. It's just really sad. I don't know, but that's a thing. So I thought that was interesting. Um, there are some really interesting female figures in Greek history. Um, one in particular that I found really interesting was Agnotis. And she was one of the first like female physicians. We don't actually know 100% if she existed, but like she's talked about. So it could have been like a mythos, kind of like, you know, the mythology and everything, but it she could have actually been a person too. So um, it was said uh, women weren't allowed to study medicine or like much of anything really. So Agnotis, um, it was said that she went to learn in um, Alexandria and she dressed as a man, um, you know, to be able to study and to learn. And then she came back to Greece and she helped women who were suffering. Um, there was a lot of problems with, um, there's a lot of problems with like women being afraid to tell their male doctors about issues they were having and like dying because of it. And so Agnotis would offer her services to these women and um, they would initially be kind of like leery, like, no, I don't want to tell you about my personal, my personal lady problems. And um, Agnotis would then lift up her skirt or whatever um because like men still kind of wore dresses so she'd lift up her skirt and show her genitals to these women proving then that she was a woman um it said that she probably saved a lot of lives and you know she was just kind of a fighter so i think that's really interesting um even when the system's trying to keep you down women <laughs> like you can you can do it so i thought that was really a neat story um i'm trying to think we're gonna say the first Persian War. During the first Persian War, they were able to beat back the Persians by, um, so Sparta, obviously they had their land unit, their elite uh, hoplite phalanx, where as you see in 300, like each man's shield is like connected to the other man. And then, you know, like they all have spears and stuff. Um, so that was a really effective fighting tool. And then actually Athens, uh, unlike the depiction in 300 where they're like kind of sissies um he er, they had a really great navy so they didn't participate on foot but they kicked ass in their navy so good for them um they did eventually fall in the second persian war um and actually that was the one that Leonidas was involved in. Leonidas was not a part of the first one. So, you know, you learn something new every day. There were lots of interesting rulers in both of these places. Um, one of the most prolific in Athenian history would be Pericles. So Pericles, he's kind of like a patron of the arts. I really liked all that. Um, but before we get too attached to him, he made this law about citizenship 
um, because before you only needed one citizen parent to have a citizen child like if either parent was a citizen the child was a citizen um, but after this point he decided that um, both parents should have to be citizens in order for their child to have citizenship um, that obviously had long-standing consequences and again that's part of the that's part of the controversy with Mira is that like you know she um, wasn't considered like his legitimate wife or whatever his her husband's legitimate wife um I think those are really interesting figures there's also obviously Alexander the Great he was part of Macedonia uh, which is another yet another city-state in good old Greece there's actually like rumors about his parentage like his whole life um, you know he had issues with his dad Philip but he was a great he was a great strategist and he had this big old horse and I can't remember the name but I'll post it on here of the horse and there was like this legend about how as like a 10 year old there was an untamable horse and he managed to tame it and like that's what he was famous for I guess um, originally so <laughs> you know interesting claim to fame um, probably didn't make a lot of people very like I don't know what you call it um, probably didn't make a lot of people very confident in his ability to lead um, just so you guys know I'm actually working off of this Morphe palette it's a big boy I kind of fallen out of love with this palette it's the Morphe 39s such a gem uh, I'm trying to I've kind of fallen out of love with it I'm trying to fall back in love with it so I'm gonna do my entire eye look today from this palette I was already almost tempted to not so just to keep myself honest here I'm going to you know try and keep going with this Anyways, uh. and I know this probably isn't going to be everyone's cup of tea, but again, I really want to emphasize this is a learning channel. We're not just going to learn makeup, we're going to learn about history, we're going to learn about life, we're going to learn about ourselves. So um, I hope that you will come along on this journey with me and have as much fun as I am having on it. I need like a really dense brush. Oh. Oh. I'm already running out, out of stuff to say about ancient Greece. Again, there's just a lot that we don't know about it. Um, obviously, like the Homeric poems are a huge deal. They weren't written in the time, like. The Iliad and the Odyssey were written by Homer like hundreds of years after the supposed advance events had already happened. So we can't say that they're true, uh, especially when they talk about like, you know, the gods as if they're real people, which, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say that they're not because I don't know. I don't know. Um, I mean, I think if you believe in like the Christian God, um, who, by the way, doesn't even claim to be the only God. He just claims to be the only one that matters. Uh, Yahweh. So I think if you can believe in that, you know, why not believe in the Greek gods? Screw it. Or the pagan gods, or the Norse gods, or whoever the hell, you know? Ah. So. That's my two cents. <clears throat> but yeah, he does talk about them like they're real. Um, basically what we know is that 
the stories were passed down by oral tradition. And so, um, Homer just kind of wrote them down, like long after they were said to have happened. Um, that's kind of a, that's kind of a running theme with like early history and like prehistory. Um, oral history is like really important to a lot of cultures. Um, you'll see that for sure in like Native American cultures and some African cultures um, where stories are just passed down verbally. They're very interesting. Maybe I'll read you guys a fairy tale one of these times. I took a, I took a class on um, like fables and fairy tales of like different cultures and there are some really interesting ones in there. There was one that I really liked from the Native Americans. There were several that I really liked from African cultures. Um, obviously like the European ones. I really like the German ones because they're like exceptionally violent. Like um, Ashen Puddle, which is uh, the German Cinderella. So basically like her sisters actually, her stepsisters is actually succeed in tricking the prince into saying that or into believing that they are the you know that they are ash and puddle um but when they ride on the on the prince's horse back to the palace as they're going by ash and puddle's mom's grave who helped her with all the dresses and stuff like that's basically her fairy god godmother um a crow that sits on the grave goes and pecks out their eyes so that's a whole thing. Um, all of those are really violent. <laughs> the French ones are a lot nicer, but I don't think they're near as fun. Um, maybe that's just me. I'm kind of a weirdo, so I always think those are really interesting. Uh, I think it says a lot about a culture, you know, um, what their mythos is. And I think a lot of people miss that. They're just like, wow, that's crazy. How interesting. And they don't really look at like why the myths are the way they are and like what the society that they're looking at actually would have um, looked and act, acted like. So I find that fascinating personally. Um, shoot, what else do I want to talk about? Because I already ran out of stuff about ancient Greece. I've like spaced everything that I wrote my research paper on. So having a good time already and I can't find I need an eyebrow brush because my brows are sparse and thin and sad we're gonna go ahead and talk about ooh, about some things about Brazil I'm gonna talk specifically about this book about this guy named Domingos Alvarez really interesting guy uh, figure in Brazilian history um, he was like a healer and and I will link the book and I'll probably put a picture in here of the book it's a really interesting book um, I read it last semester in my Brazilian history class and I just thought it was really eye-opening very interesting um, it takes place in like colonial times in Brazil, um, like when the slave trade is still going hot, as it did. Um, a lot of the work down there was very labor intensive, so they had a lot of slaves. Um, in Brazil, there's a lot of natural resources, like, or I, I don't know if this is still true, but I'm going to assume it is. Um, like dye wood, there's like syrups and stuff. Um, the dye wood, like when you would do certain things to it, it would like turn blue. And there weren't like a lot of blue dyes at the time. Um, there was like indigo, but like that was it. So there was a lot of slavery down there, um, trying to get all this dye wood. They did a lot, a lot, a lot of deforestation really, really, really fast. Um, the Portuguese and the Spanish did. Brazil is a Portuguese colony, or was a Portuguese colony, if you know. Um, they did achieve independence eventually um, in a really weird way. But yeah, that's the whole thing. So, the story of Domingos, he 
lived down there. Um, he was a slave and he was brought over from Africa. He was sold into slavery by a political adversary in uh, Africa. It was like this king, I can't remember the guy's name, but um, he was like one of these African kings near like the slave ports um, and he would sell his political adversaries into slavery which was not very nice um, but basically Domingos was kind of a political guy like part of part of his he was a healer part of his healing techniques um, actually required like talking about politics and stuff to a certain ex extent um, so there's that. He did a lot of natural medicine. Um, he did get sold into slavery and he got sent down to Brazil. Uh, when he arrived in Brazil, he got sold to a master on a sugar plantation. He caused a lot of problems for this person. Um, they didn't find him particularly suited to the work um, not because he wasn't fit, but just because he was a pain in the ass, basically. He, like, wouldn't stop disobeying his master and, um, all of those things, which, you know, more power to you. So he ended up getting sold into slavery in Rio de Janeiro, um, which was, like, the big city. You know, that's the capital of Brazil, if you don't know. Or I think it's the capital. Don't quote me on that. Um... It's certainly the most well-known city in Brazil. So he got sold down there. He ended up having another master. I can't remember too much about that one. Um, it, he was bought to like heal this guy's wife. But I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, and again, don't quote me on this, he ended up <laughs> healing her in more ways than one, if you know what I mean. Um, so he ended up getting himself in trouble there. He was sold uh, yet again to another master. This guy was pretty cool to Domingos. He didn't really give a shit what Domingos did as long as it made him money. So he had Domingos... Um, like heal all these people, like run basically a healing practice. And um, he, actually Domingos even, <laughs> Domingos despite being a slave, actually ended up paying rent to this guy to own this space, or not to own it, but to, to work out of it. Um, the good thing though is that Domingos actually was able to start saving money and um because his his master let him keep part of the profits which was another good incentive for him to keep uh you know doing his master's bidding and enriching him eventually domingos managed to purchase his manumission from his master and he was free at that point he went and started his own um healing business Hmm. He's went and started his own healing business, you know, uh, and was serving the locals just kind of on his own accord. And everything was going fine and dandy until it was said that he was like hexing white people, um, which apparently is a heretical crime. I did not know this, uh, but it's because supposedly um you're basically like if you hex someone you're like spitting in the face of god uh and his gift of free will to you and to those around you so hexing people is a big no-no <laughs> um like it's not even really clear if he actually did it or not but either way he was not very fortunate he ended up um being sent to Lisbon in Portugal to undergo trial for heresy which included 
being tortured because of course it did. So of course Domingos confessed uh, under duress of course and um, like there, there's this other thing so uh, if you if you are convicted of heresy and you don't confess then you have to be purified by fire. Um, so it's probably a good thing that Domingos confessed because he didn't want to be burned alive. Um, he was never going to make it back to Brazil where his wife and daughter, because he did end up getting married and having a family, where his wife and daughter were. So he never saw them again, which is really sad. Um, and then he had to like go on this walk. It's kind of like the walk of shame, you know, from Game of Thrones with him and like all of the other people who had been convicted of heresy. Uh, some of them did not confess and were burned alive. Uh, Domingos was not. He lived out the rest of his days in Portugal. I don't think he was executed, but I will double check and I will put it in the video so you know for sure. But I don't think he was. Um, because he did confess. So there's that whole thing. It was really sad. Um, there's a lot of other weird stuff in like especially Brazilian slavery. Like slavery is just a horrifying and interesting institution at, in general. But like there are some weird things. So, um, one of the things that could earn you manumission as a slave in Brazil was um, if you were working, if you were a slave working in the diamond mines, um, again, enriching your master or masters or whatever, then if you found a diamond over a certain weight, you would win a special award as well as your letter of manumission. So that was a huge incentive to a lot of slaves to like work harder and try and find bigger and bigger gems. So that was another way you could earn manumission. Um, after slavery was abolished, which was not until really, really late, like there was a huge kind of like slum, at least in the cities, like there were slums in all the cities of like all of these free, like mostly filled with free blacks who didn't have a lot of money. Um, and there's still actually problems with that today um, with police violence. Like Brazil has its own problem with police brutality, um, which is really horrible, but you know, it's something that we should probably remember. So let me think. Oh yes, we were going to talk about how Brazil gained its independence. So um, the royal family of Portugal, um, they actually were being persecuted by somebody, I can't remember who. There was like a war going on and there were, they were being invaded <laughs> in, uh, in Europe. So the royal family actually came over to Brazil and decided to live there. Um, and And uh, eventually, you know, once the war was over, they wanted to go back to their home countries, but they decided to leave, I think his name was Pedro, Pedro II, in charge in Brazil while they were gone. So he stayed behind and then eventually ended up just like taking over the country, like unceremoniously, like, hey, this is my country now. <laughs> and they were just kind of like, whatever, because it was, it was kind of an expensive uh, endeavor. Like colonial enterprises were very expensive for the royals. So sometimes it was just better when, you know, they rebelled to just let him go, you know? We see that sometimes. Um, we saw that in Haiti. Especially because France was in complete disarray at the time um, when the Haitian Revolution occurred. 
uh, would have been like late 18th century, which if you know anything about history, you know, 1789 wasn't a good year for France, okay? So, yeah. Um, but anyways, Pedro took over Brazil and just kind of ran it as his own country. Um, yeah. There's some really interesting authors and stuff from like the 1800s. Um, there's a guy named Azevedo. I'll link one of his books in there. It's actually really interesting. It's a it's a fiction story, but it's like very debaucherous and like it's about the favelas and like life in them and the kind of people that lived there and all of those things. Here's a really interesting guy. Uh, he actually got in trouble for spending too much time in the favelas. Um, he was almost murdered by the mob because he, they thought he might be like a government plant or something, but he was just there to like draw people and like get ideas for his book. And he almost paid dearly with his life for being there too much. They're like, he hangs around, he just watches people, he's a weird guy. But yeah, the book is actually incredibly interesting, um, even if you're not like a history person. Like, it's one of those books that um, really you just can't put down. It's an interesting book. So it's about life in the favelas, it follows like a bunch of different people, and there's like a ton of sex and like debauchery, um, a lot of like social climbing and just talking about kind of like the socio-political climate of the time and like the way these favelas worked. Um, if you're interested, you should definitely check it out. It's well worth a read. It's not boring, I swear. I know a lot of people associate history with being boring, but it's really not. You just kind of have to like dig through to find what interests you um, and that can be like books written in history fiction books uh, like that it can be primary sources it can be secondary sources it can be all kinds of things you know guy he was an abolitionist um, I honestly thought like 1860 was disgustingly late to abolish slavery as we did in the United States, but Brazil actually took it a step further and did not abolish slavery until 1888. So that's a long freaking time to have slavery. It's like one of the last countries. One of the last countries to abolish the institution. And that is how my history teacher described it, like, disgustingly late. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I think that's fair. Like, slavery is really bad, but like, can you imagine an additional almost 30 years of slavery in the United States? Like, mm, not good not good um, they've had issues on their own with like racism and stuff which kind of sucks but I mean I think we all all of our all of our countries have um, dealt with these like growing pains and kind of had to come to terms I've had to kind of come to terms with that as a result. Um, for example, the police force in Brazil didn't exist until after the royals moved there and like moved into the city and they were like, there's too many black people around, like we don't have police. And that's how the police force was started down there. So they already have like a history of racism. Uh, and then like, you know, they still have problems today um, down there, like, um, police tensions are really high, de like, like way worse than here. Um, they said, I think I watched a, do I watched a documentary and I'll, and I'll link it. 
But um, I watched a documentary that said like within the last 10 years, like 5,000 black people, well, 5,000 people have been killed in the favelas, which is the poor area in the city. Uh, poor and unpermitted, by the way. Not, 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 you know, so they're like shacks, basically. It's like a shanty town. Um, some of them are more sound than others, but anyways, my, my point is uh, that 5,000 people had been killed by police in the favelas and most of those were young black men um, who had been kind of enticed either who had been caught in the crossfire because that does actually happen down there pretty frequently um, or who had been enticed into a gang membership because they were poor as fuck uh, and you know like poverty it just breeds crime you know I mean, I've seen that in my own life, like, I lived in an area that wasn't so good, and there was definitely a lot more crime there, um, and that, I mean, that's, that's coming from, you know, Cheyenne, Wyoming, like, not, not a high crime area, but, like, high crime for my area, you know what I mean? So, I mean, we see it today still, it's really, it actually really disappoints me that, like, more people don't understand that, like, okay, um, not to get too political, but like with the Black Lives Matter thing, like people are like, well, they commit so much crime, you know, it's like, well, there's a lot of socioeconomic factors that lead into what you call black crime, like the whole 1350 thing. And a lot of it is gang related. And I think that's what people don't understand. Like, it's not just people being violent for the sake of being violent. It's like violence to make money. Because they're also disproportionately poor. But again, we don't want to talk about that. Like, people here don't want to hear about it. And I get really disappointed because I'm just like, you know, if you're going to have an opinion on how someone else lives their life, you should probably at least try to understand things from their point of view. And again, that's not like a universal experience, but like, you know, a lot of it is like drug trafficking and stuff like that. And like gang related crimes related to that. And again, like all of that stuff wouldn't exist if it wasn't for A, like legalizing drugs and like B, ending poverty or at least limiting it, like helping people. I mean, there's there have been like a lot of victims of like redlining. There was even like charters here in town. I'm pretty sure. I'm gonna look it up because I don't remember off the top of my head. But hey, hey, sorry, my cat. Uh, because I'm gonna take this off. Oof. <clears throat> what was I saying? Oh yeah, charters. Charters here in town where like black people couldn't live in certain neighborhoods and like we're forced to live in the worst part of town, which if we live here, we all know where it is. I do feel really dewy. I love it. Like, I never had foundation that made me look dewy before, so I'm really happy with that. So, yeah. That was the whole thing. Um, but there's, like, huge racial tensions between police and um, poor Brazilians, you know? There have been police killed, too, and they also provide a stat for that in there. I think it was, like... 200 cops had died there in the last 10 years. A lot of police there feel like it's a death sentence to be a cop. Um, you know, because there's just a lot of, like, tensions and gangs. They operate in the favelas a lot. Um, there's a lot of militarization. The police are militarized. The gangs are militarized. Like, they have serious weaponry. And, you know, it's just sad. It's just really sad. So... 
I think it's important to understand. I know everyone says, like, we should understand our history, but, like, I don't really think they know what that means. I think it means you kind of have to look at everything from all sides. I'm not going to condone violence. Like, we disavow. But, like, kind of understand where it comes from, too, you know? I think that's pretty crucial, especially to like fixing a problem. We can't just be like, <laughs> my favorite thing is like, well, blue lives matter. Like, okay, what does that fix? What does that fix? That doesn't change the fact that like black people are being killed at the hands of police. At a, dis at a disproportionate rate, and again, I'll, I know there's going to be a lot of, like, probably contention on that point, but I'm going to post Vasha's research document. I think it really just encapsulates, like, the problem in a way that is, you know, academic, scientific. So I'll link that in the description. It has, uh, the beginning part of it is all stats about, um, like, bias in the justice system against black people, um, black crime, all kinds of stuff like that. And it's really informational and I think it proves my point. I don't know if we have a little too much there. I should probably do my boobies because they're red but like I don't want to have to make up my entire chest it's just weird Ugh. okay I think I'm pretty close to done um, I am going to go ahead and blush I love this shade this middle one the middle one because it's like a it's like a rosy shade but it's got a gold shift and I freaking love it it's the I actually got this from my dad's uh, girlfriend now wife she's my stepmom oh my god so yeah I got this from my new stepmom um it's a Betty Boop blush palette so yeah she got it in her ipsy she didn't like it so I took it Oh, I took it because I do like blush. I do. I like it very much. I don't usually use blush, but I've been getting more and more into it. I think like the draping is nice. So yeah. Yeah. So Brazil has a lot of problems like that, and they and that's like a historical thing too. Um, police also would not let people um, learn or practice capoeira, which is a like dance fighting style that was indeed made up by slaves to practice fighting um, like without their master's knowledge. The masters did find out pretty fast, but um, yeah. Originally, they were like, oh, look, they're playing. How cute. And then once they figured out, they were like <laughs> finding out ways to like kick their ass, you know. It was kind of a different story. It wasn't allowed anymore. So even, even, and this is like even, like there are people alive today who are not allowed to practice capoeira, just so we're clear. Um, I watched another documentary, which I will also link about capoeira and the history behind it and also just like the community that has been built around it thought that was fascinating but yeah there's a man in there who says that the police that they would like have one guy up in the tree um to watch for police in case they decided to come break up their capoeira groups so i thought that was really freaking interesting um 
but yeah, it's kind of a more accepted thing now. And there's like instruments that were made specifically for capoeira out of like very basic materials. Uh, like the berimbau. I think that's how you say it, berimbau. Oh, I forgot to tell you too, the other day when I did my makeup tutorial, I pronounced the name of the person, uh, or of the brand that does my foundation totally wrong. It is apparently Lorac, not Lorac. I did think it was a weird name because um, it sounded like the Lorax to me, but I didn't question it. You know, it's not my brand, but apparently it's Lorac. Uh, it doesn't look like that to me phonetically, but it's fine. So yeah, that's the whole thing. So yeah, there's been issues uh, with police in Brazil for a long time, and I think it's easier for us to maybe look or it might be easier for us to kind of look at Brazil as a case study instead of the United States, just because emotions are high concerning the United States right now. <laughs> and police, I mean, that's the thing is like, we don't want to think that we're doing bad things. Like nobody wants to think the United States is doing bad things. Well, nobody in the US anyways. Nobody wants to think that. Nobody wants to think that that's happening. I mean, I certainly don't. But unfortunately, I'm a realist, so I kind of just have to, like, deal with the information that's out there. And the information out there says, like, we might need to do some soul searching. So, here we are. Doing some soul searching. I'm doing my best, man. I think it's important to hold police accountable. Um, you know, we give them power because they're supposed to be the best of us, right? Uh, that's why they get the license to carry a gun everywhere and like they can shoot people if they need to and they have immunity and all this crap. So if we don't hold them to a high standard, then we're really doing ourselves a disservice. Um, I definitely relate, like my stepdad was a cop and I, you know, so I definitely understand like people who are like, well, my uncle's a cop and like, I can't imagine him ever doing anything bad. It's like, okay, I understand that, but we need to remove that. We need to remove ourselves from that mentality of like, well, my friend so-and-so would never do this. It's like, at least not intentionally. And that's the thing is like, it's not necessarily intentionally being done in a lot of cases. I mean, sometimes it is like there are racist cops out there. Don't get it twisted. But a lot of it just comes down to like bias. And that's something that's really hard for a lot of people to accept that they have like subconscious biases. I'm really digging this look, guys. I love it. Oh my god. Okay. Hang on. I'm going to come back. I'm going to do lips in just a second. And um, I think I'm going to put some of that like glitter stuff on the inner corners. I think that'll be fun. Cool. Okay. So I wasn't going to do like a full, I wasn't going to go like full goth today, but I just think like it's dark and mysterious enough that it makes me really want to do like black lipstick. So we're going to go with it. I love this Lime Crime lipstick. I will say that I was Googling, um, I am really new to all this makeup stuff, honestly. Like, I've been doing my makeup for a long time, but like, I was really poor, so I was always using like Wet n Wild and stuff for like a long time, long time. And like drugstore brands. Um, I hadn't, I wasn't really as familiar with a lot of these like, uh, bigger name brands that are more expensive. I'm learning so much. I decided to look up the, the brand last night because someone on some public forum was like indicating that maybe there was some drama there and oh my there was drama <laughs> and I feel bad because I already bought it but like I'd say it's mm, probably been resolved ish I'm not gonna feel bad about buying it and I'm certainly not gonna feel bad about owning it I mean it's already in my collection it wasn't done out of any malice so We'll see if we go back. I'll have to kind of, you know, reevaluate the things that I like. I also bought like a Jeffree Star lipstick because I wanted a good black lipstick. 
but um, yeah, I didn't know about any of that drama either, so forgive me. Forgive me, internet. But yeah. Uh -huh, uh. It's actually just kind of crazy. Ah! Oh shit. The drama in the makeup community. I was not expecting that. Like, I was like, oh, this will be fun. It's going to be like a fun makeup thing, right? We love it. <laughs> but no. It's like a lot of like cringy controversies instead. I'm just like, eh. <laughs> and I mean, I guess that makes sense. Like, You know, makeup, the makeup community is going to be comprised primarily of younger people, like, you know, 14 to 40 ish. And they're going to be a lot more socially conscious than um, probably older people would be. So if anything does happen, um, they're going to be aware. <laughs> um, so there's that. Which I think is good, honestly. Like, I want to be in a community that I can be proud of. I don't want to... Ah. Oh shit. We're having a hell of a time today, kids. Ah! <laughs> oh, God. I don't have my glasses on. I can't really see all that well. I do wear glasses for those of you who don't know. Sorry, I'm being really quiet. I know I've spent like this whole time like proselytizing. I guess I would call it that, but usually that's um, <laughs> that has religious con connotations. But um, if that were the case, I probably couldn't proselytize because I'm not religious. Although, as you guys know kind of into witchcraft but I don't know if it's like the actual like thing itself or just kind of the aesthetic or let me see I'm gonna see if we can do a close-up on my eyes okay I guess not <laughs> That's alright, we'll do it in a minute. This is darker than I thought it would be. I think if you guys have any suggestions on like historical events or anything that you guys want to know more about, um, you know, you should leave them in the comments. Um, 
Um. Ah. And then maybe I can do some of those. Like I can do like video essays where it's a little more prepared. Today it was just kind of like me ran rambling about things that I already know, but I'd be happy to like try and learn stuff so that we can talk about it during makeup time. I think it's nice to make something that's fun with something that's like socially conscious. Cause it's like, it can be a lot. It can be a lot to kind of keep on keeping on and with that I think we're pretty much done like I said I will go ahead and do a close-up here in just a second but um, thanks for hanging out again um, I do have a patreon I have it linked in the description if you want to support me I would love to have you as a patron uh, makeup is expensive, so it would be nice. Um, I especially, like, I really want to try some things from Juvia's place and, um, like, maybe some green looks and, you know, just other things that I don't necessarily have in my collection right now. Um, you know, you're not obligated to, to, to support me or help me in any way, but, you know, I am unemployed and, you know, every little bit helps. Um, especially if you like my content, you know, if you don't like my content, then probably don't worry about it. But, <laughs> um, also follow me on Twitter and on Instagram and I will see you all later. Bye.